Hello, Dust here. Uh, I decided to make a video today on the state of North American Counter-Strike Global Offensive, which kind of begins its story, or the current state that I want to talk about begins uh, towards the very end of 2014, and it, it comes into 2015 in preparations for some of our North American teams to, to represent the country or the continent uh, at the 2015 Katowice, which is going to be the first major of the year. Now, originally, I was going to publish this as an article, and you may have seen me talking about it on social media in the weeks leading up to me recording this video. Uh, but the more and more I read it, the more that I didn't really like what I wrote. Uh, it just didn't come out the way that I wanted to. And the more I thought about it, the more that I realized that, you know, speaking about things has always been my preferred medium on how I like to convey my thoughts and how I like to, to, to discuss things. And so I felt it best to try to do a vlog just to kind of talk about how I felt and to kind of really summarize what we've seen here recently and maybe kind of speculate on what we might see in the future uh, and just kind of understand where the North American Counter-Strike scene is right now because obviously a lot has happened uh, in the past few months as 2014 came to a close and 2015 has begun. And basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to take each team in the North American scene that have received the most press or have been uh, a member of the most, you know, prestigious events that we've seen recently and just kind of highlight, you know, where they've come from, what they've done so far and what kind of their outlook is going forward. Um, now, granted, this is just my opinion. Others may have differing opinions, but I think that I have some good some good data to kind of back up what I have to say, and uh, you know, people may feel free to disagree, but this is just how I see things. So I'm going to start off with Cloud9, because obviously this is the team that probably has the most recognition of all the teams that are remaining right now. I mean, uh, obviously with the whole I buy power situation that knocked one of the behemoths of the scene out, and so thus what we are left with is Cloud9 really being the longest standing you know, North American professional team that's had any type of success uh, internationally, though that success is limited. Um, so Cloud9 kind of starts out as a bunch of versions of different teams. You know, some of their players come from teams such as, you know, the Area 51 and Quantic days way back when. Uh, but the uh, majority of them kind of come from the complexity lineup, you know, that we saw throughout most of 2013 uh, with a few changes along the way. So, I mean, their last event as Complexity was, you know, back in the Season 16 ESCA land, and after that they, you know, became part of the Cloud9 banner, and they picked up Shroud uh, in place of Anger, who was kind of a temporary replacement on the team after Swag had left to go to I by Power, and you'll, you'll probably recall some of these storylines that, that took place in that year. But where I really want to start with them is actually at Cologne. Now, coming into Cologne, uh, they always had a knack for maybe not always being able to best their North American rivals in I by Power. You know, in fact, they would usually play slower than I by Power at the ESCA lands. So this includes like season 15's ESCA land, season 16's ESCA land, and ultimately also the last one we had uh, in North America. It's the season 17 event. Um, they also would play slower than them at uh, you know some of the Sevo events. So, and their online play was always kind of shaky, but the bottom line is, is that what we would almost always have, it never failed when we went into some type of major. It always seemed as though I by Power had the most hype surrounding them because they were beating Cloud9 or Complexity domestically in some of the, the events that we had here with ESCA and even, you know, one of the SoCal revival events that we saw, though that event was kind of... Uh, kind of debatable on how much impact it really had on the scene as far as standings and rankings and stuff like that go. But um, the point is, is that even though I by Power kind of going with the most hype because they seem to have the most recent success, it was always the, the Cloud9 core that would be the team that actually got out of groups and would actually pose somewhat of a threat in quarterfinals. Of course, they even had better than that way back when DreamHack Winter 2013 when they took top four. And that was kind of a huge, huge accomplishment for a North American team uh, to be able at the first major ever to be at the top four. Now, they were never able to, you know, 
keep that success going. Uh, they still did have some top eight finishes at Katowice 2014 and Cologne, uh, so the other two majors of that period. But it, it, they never were able to get back to that top four era. They always kind of resorted below that, mostly because they were you know, just getting eliminated in quarterfinals by a nip. But basically starting in Cologne, I feel like, though Cologne was still a success for them to some degree because they were able to make it out of groups and play pretty competitively in the quarterfinals, this is where we begin to start seeing this slump or this decline in play uh, and, and the, the Cloud9's lack of ability to be able to, to perform at the standard that they had been for, for a pretty long time because it, no matter what you say about their potential or, or what, their, what their abilities were, there was no denying the fact that they were at least a top eight team and stayed in that position for quite a long time which I'm sure they weren't happy about. I'm sure they wanted to be better than that, and everyone else did too that was a North American fan. But at the very least, they were able to claim that, whereas I Buy Power weren't able to do so until towards the end of the year of 2014. So essentially the way the slump kind of begins is actually, to me, I believe, at Cologne. Now, I know at Cologne they did make it out of groups, and they did go on to play against NIP, and they were competitive in that series. There was some crazy 16-14 games and part of that it was kind of this heartbreaking game on cobblestone that led to their elimination that it seemed like they might be able to win and might be able to make it to the semis but um and then of course nip would go on to to win this event so that's another thing to think about but i think the slump still begins here just simply because of how poorly they did play in group play even though they did find a way to get out uh, and this is no secret that they themselves would probably tell you the same thing i mean when they were playing against uh you know these teams like titan on dust two and they were barely scraping together and winning overtime or even whenever they were playing against dignitas on mirage you know obviously everyone remembers these hero plays that hiko made uh in these clutch situations for them to be able to advance uh just by the skin of their teeth i mean it was so close and it wasn't really the the level of play that you would want to see to be confident that they really did have the potential to make a deep run so while they still held on to their top eight status, it wasn't the, the promising performance that one would hope for, I guess you could say. And then things only got worse as they began to lose their knack for being able to at least make it out of groups. And it started at Face It, where they got eliminated by a tiebreaker. Uh, this is due to the fact that they split maps with Virtus Pro, and they weren't able to get any wins on LDLC, so they got eliminated in groups. Um, it was via tiebreaker, but in reality, they really did control their own fate here. I mean, they, they, if they would have been able to, you know, beat Virtus Pro a second time or just get more rounds, they, they could have won a tiebreaker there. So, so they really were in control of their own fate. Granted, their losses come to teams that were ranked above them. You know, both these other teams that they lost to VP and LDLC were probably both in the top four at the time, whereas they were, you know, like I said, towards number eight. So maybe it's not so surprising that they lost to teams ranked above them but if they wanted to go on and kind of increase their status then this was something that they needed to do they needed to be able to win against these teams to, in some capacity to advance through groups uh and they fell short and and i really think that they should have had the ability to, to try to play a little bit better and get the rounds they needed to to make sure the tiebreaker didn't necessarily matter but we'll kind of leave that and we'll move on to ESWC which was even more of a heartbreaking tiebreaker for for Cloud9 because they went four and one which is a good record and the only loss they had was to LDLC of course when I'm saying LDLC this is now what Envious is but they were still LDLC at the time that's why I'm kind of using that 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 name um they only really played I guess one bad half of CS I think Sean Garris was kind of quoted as saying something to that effect of well we only played one bad half of CS to get eliminated from this event in group play and I will admit this is pretty heartbreaking because, once again, they, they did everything they needed to do other than lose to LDLC on Inferno, which at that time and even to this day, that's a pretty powerful team on Inferno. And Inferno's, you know, even though despite, you know, Cloud9's, you know, confidence in their ability to play Inferno, the results definitely speak to their struggles on it. I think going into Aspen, they had some crazy, like, 20-something percent win rate on Inferno, so it was never really uh, a good map for them anyway. Uh, but, you know, once again, they, they lost in groups, which is disappointing. And then it just gets even worse because when they go on to DreamHack Winter 2014, you know, this is uh, 
they're at the majors now. This is something that they, they have been able to get out of groups in the past every other time. Granted, at Cologne, it was through miracle plays, to be honest, but they still found a way, at least. Um, and going into this event, they got crushed in groups. You know, they lose to Hellraisers 16-5, to uh, and then they go on to play against Fnatic on Dust 2 and get crushed there as well. Now, it is true that Hellraisers were just monsters in group play at this event. They, they, would still, they would beat Fnatic, actually, as well in a close game on Mirage and actually take the first seed out of the group. So it's not as if Hellraisers is some type of pushover team. Uh, they, they were really, really effective in group play. Of course, they get crushed in brackets as soon as they got to it. But they, they did show some, some good play in the groups. And uh, so it's not crazy shocking that they lost there. And then losing to Fnatic, I mean, that was expected. You know, they really did need to beat Hellraisers to be able to kind of advance um, probably twice, right, the way the bracket would have worked out if they would have been able to beat Hellraisers the first time. And Hellraisers doesn't get this shocking one on Fnatic, then it should have been them playing Hellraisers twice, basically, um, to get through. But, I mean, they just got crushed is the bottom line. And then with the Season 17 ESCA land right afterwards, they once again got upset you know, losing to Denial, getting 2 would by them, you know, losing a, some close games on Inferno and Mirage, just getting eliminated from the event at fourth place, which is one of their worst finishes ever on NA soil. So to say that 2014 or the end of 2014 was a rough time for Cloud9 is, is kind of an understatement because they really did take a step down from their consistent abilities to make it out of groups, their consistent abilities to, to prove themselves to be the top eight of the world. And, and you know, fight in quarterfinals and, and, and be on the verge of maybe breaking through and, and coming up the ranks at least a little bit further. And at the end of the year, it just it didn't look good at all. Um, now, you could argue how bad this slump really was. I mean, at ESWC, for example, kind of crazy that they did so well in group play, only really lost one game and got eliminated. So that is kind of heartbreaking. But at face it, I think they definitely they're kind of definitely at fault for that. You can't really make much excuse for them to not have done a little bit better at face it to advance. But you could also conclude that they lost to teams that you expected them to lose to. Uh, you know, Virtus Pro and LDLC at face it. You know, Fnatic was their eliminating team on DreamHack Winter. Uh, LDLC was a team they lost to in ESWC group play. So it, it's not as if they, they lost to teams that they shouldn't lose to. Um, they just didn't beat teams they needed to beat to be able to excel and to prove themselves to be at a higher uh, stature than, than what they were actually currently ranked at. Uh, so it's debatable how bad the slump really was, but it's certainly easy to conclude that there was a decline in play. Um, and it's been evident since Cologne, really, as far as their struggles on trying to, to advance. And essentially what these struggles have led to was to them having to make a change. Hiko leaves the team, uh, just kind of citing that he had a difference of opinion on what needed to be done to turn things around for Cloud9, uh, whether this be changes in roles that players played or maybe even making some roster changes that he wanted to make that the, the rest of the team was not agreeable to, which was kind of forced him out or it made him feel that it was his best bet to get out. Uh, it forces them to to have a new face. It, you know, they pick up Shazam, a dedicated opera who had been playing with Denial at the Season 17 ESCA land, and he did well there. Uh, he, you know, he was part of the reason why they were able to eliminate Cloud9 from the tournament. And it's not as if Cloud9 had all these these options out there, because at this point, I by power still pretty tight knit in the group that they want to have, and it includes someone like Hiko who was coming in, and you know, they were going to get dazed back, and it, there just wasn't really a whole lot out there for Cloud9 to go for in reality. I mean, I guess they could have tried to have got another rifler like a Nitro or a Desi or something like that instead of going for an op, but if they really wanted an op, which it seemed like Sean didn't want an op, so going for a dedicated op does make sense, you know, their, their options were limited. It was either kind of like Shazam or a Dren, maybe JDM, uh, maybe someone else I haven't named. Uh, they didn't really have a whole lot of options, if we're honest. And so... Coming into 2015, obviously on a slump, and now with a new player that you have to make adjustments to, things didn't go well for them. You know, they go to X Games Aspen. They have a huge loss to Kaboom on Mirage. Very shocking. I guess now, in hindsight, it's not as shocking just because we've seen how good Kaboom can be on Mirage, and they even went on to beat Fnatic at ClutchCon, and 
they've gained the respect of a lot of the professional community. You know, I, I know I saw a tweet from NBK who was talking about wanting to see Kaboom's demos and how Kaboom was kind of showing Europeans how Mirage needed to be played and some of these different thoughts. So in hindsight, they were kind of Kaboom's first victims and a kind of, you know, Kaboom's first step in proving that they were kind of a legitimate international team. I'm not sure, you know, where you'd rank them. Uh, obviously, we'll have to wait and see how they perform at Katowice 2015, but they've at least proven they can play Mirage really well against some of the best teams in the world. And so maybe that loss isn't as bad now, but at the time it looked really bad. Uh, it, was, it was something that we, this should have been kind of a breeze for Cloud9, or at least we thought uh, at the time. Now, from there, they beat Nip, so good game there. I mean, they did what they needed to do. Shazam actually played pretty well in this game. Uh, so it was almost looking positive for them, but then they just get absolutely decimated by Dignitas, which is now TSM uh, on Dust 2. I think it was 16 to 2. It was a terrible loss. They just looked horrible. They they were getting outgunned everywhere, just outclassed in all aspects of the game, and it just looked so rough. Now, once again, they're losing to, well, outside of their loss of Kaboom, the loss of Dignitas this is a team ranked higher than them. But like I said, if you want to be the best, you want to, you know, work your way up the ladder, you have to be able to win games like these. And B2, typically a pretty strong map for Cloud9. I mean, their strongest maps are probably Nuke, Dust2, and, you know, maybe Cash to a degree. But it's definitely in their pool of maps they feel comfortable playing on. So to lose that poorly in an elimination situation is definitely, you know, kind of depressing. And so, yeah, I mean, they just, uh, they've been in the slump in 2014. How bad it is is up to you. For me, it is a slump for sure. There, there's no doubt there has been a decline in play. Even when they've been successful, there's been a decline that is apparent when you watch their games. Maybe it's not as bad as some people make it out to be. Some people just say, oh, they got eliminated in groups, you know, three events in a row or four events in a row including X Games of 2015 if you don't include ESCA land and all that because there is no group stage there it's just a, a double LM bracket so it's four events in a row they get eliminated in groups and I mean th so there's definitely a decline in play there but it's not as bad of a slump I think as people make it out to be because if we're honest about it they're still ranked at about the same ranking that they were going into Cologne you know months and months ago as they are now Today, I think, what, they, they were ranked 8 for the longest time, and I guess, like, according to Thorin's rankings, they're ranked number 9, which 8 or 9 is probably still pretty valid for where where they're at and what they've been doing. So it's not as if they took, like, this huge hit on where they rank internationally. They're still at about the same, you know, point, but they're not making any strides to improve, at least yet, or at least it doesn't appear that way. And why is this? would be a question why, why are they in this state why you know being kind of now the leading you know figure for NA Counter-Strike why are they in this state and it's tough to say but it seems as though we can get some type of insights from what Hiko's thoughts were leaving the team which I think do have some legitimacy and, and Hiko does talk about roles about how they were never really clearly defined. They were shuffling around so much. They never really got comfortable and settled into a certain system. You know, Sean Gare's back and forth opping. Symphis was picking up the op at times. It was almost like they just couldn't figure out, you know, roles that everyone were comfortable with, and that would actually produce something. So, so there was that. You know, Hiko talks about Shroud. When they picked him up, he was a bit of a gamble, but he did prove that he could play very well at Cologne individually. And everyone had always had this rep, or Shroud himself had had this reputation of being a great aimer, you know, an up and coming player, a, a guy that did have a lot of potential and a very high skill ceiling. And, and that probably still is true. But Hiko points out that Shroud really didn't get any better between when he joined the team back in the days of Cologne up until today. He hasn't really shown any improvement. He's been pretty much the same player and you would think that a guy that has a lot of raw talent and potential could be molded into something greater and maybe turn out to be some type of star for North America uh, or at least be Cloud9's go-to guy to make an impact and to, and to, and to work their way up the ranks but uh, he's he's had some off games to be honest in, in, in some of his play and he, he hasn't necessarily gotten crazy better um, now at the Katowice qualifiers we just saw he actually did play very very well but he needs to be able to maintain that and actually grow even more and kind of be someone that Cloud9 can rely on I think I think he is the best bet for Cloud9 to have some type of star based on what we've seen out of their recent play but Hiko cites that there's some obstacles in the way of Shroud being able to accomplish that which is his streaming which 
A, forces bad habits of Counter-Strike practice, the way that you're playing Counter-Strike when you're streaming and matchmaking or pugs with friends or for entertainment for viewers. It's not the way you want to be playing CS, and it can, you know, force you to develop bad habits, and it can, you know, get you playing CS the wrong way and, and just not really help you improve in how you should be playing the game. Uh, granted, he enjoys it. It's a career for him. He, he makes a, a decent living from what I understand doing it, so maybe it is kind of hard to pull away from that. And also there's this... From what Hiko also says is this lack of, of viewing demos, of scouting opponents. You know, Sean may be doing this as an in-game leader, but are the other players taking the time to review their own gameplay, review the gameplay of their opponents, kind of learn things and, and grow their knowledge base of what they can do themselves to improve, you know, look at their own mistakes and in their individual play and how to, to better develop those things and make them better. And also to to read your opponents better, know maybe what type of weak points you feel that you can hit and exploit in your opponent individually in the types of routes that you take in your team strats and such. Now I interviewed Shroud about this on an episode of The Hype, it was the most recent one, episode 18, and I, I sp specifically asked about these criticisms that Hiko brought up, and he admitted that they were kind of valid, that you know, maybe he he probably did need to start, re, you know, watching some more demos. And as a team, they needed to start kind of reviewing these things and scout their opponents better because it seems like they go into a lot of games with a lot of uncertainty about what they might be going up against. So this is definitely some valid points that might need to be looked at. Now, they've also brought up Nothing, who has had these high expectations surrounding him ever since, you know, the late days of 1.6 as being kind of this prodigy in NA and his ability to aim and move quickly and, you know, maneuver so well and, and be pretty versatile, be that aggressive, flashy guy that's in your face and getting these entry picks and getting these crazy headshots and all this stuff. And he's always had this reputation of being this guy that NA would hopefully be able to rely on to be the star player. And he, he's never really hit that level for sure. Um, he's had moments where it's looked like maybe he would be uh, for example, there was a season 16 <clears throat> ESCA land where he was playing against Virtus Pro and he had this crazy set. He also had like a really big map against Nip when they won that set at that event. Uh, I remember watching him at Case King leading up to DreamHack winner 14. He looked really, really good. Um, and then those events. And he also looked good here at the Katowice qualifiers. He and Shroud both played really, really well. But is that going to be sustainable? So far, it has not been. Not to say that he's been absolutely god-awful or something like that either. No, that's not what I'm saying. But he hasn't necessarily been the star that Cloud9 might want. Um, now, some people may say that expectations for nothing generated by the community are way high and above what... I mean, you can't expect this guy to drop 30 bombs all the time. And, and no one's saying that. At least I'm not. It, he just needs to be able to get comfortable in some type of role and... and deliver on that you know eight out of ten times seven out of ten times whatever you know just have a higher percentage of performing at the role that he's being put in and having some type of impact on the game which he has shown he can do but it just hasn't been sustainable now i'm not going to use the words consistency and inconsistency because i guess consistently he's been below what maybe you might want to see so i can't say that he's inconsistent i mean it seems like his crazy big games have kind of been outliers in, in many regards but I think that he, he still can be useful to the team. They just need to figure out a way to, if he's not going to be the star of the team, you know, the guy running into the sites and getting entry frags and consistently opening up things for his team, if he's not going to be able to do that, if we've already seen that that's not sustainable as him being an entry fragger or, you know, and getting those big picks, maybe you can bump him down to a lurker role. Or not, well, maybe not bump down. And it's not like, you know, you have to be so much better to be at this role than another. That's not what I meant to say. But maybe move him to something else, you know, a lurker role or a support role. And if he can consistently perform at that role and get something sustainable there, then that might be well more worth your while than forcing him into some type of entry fragging position that he's not able to sustain a consistent good performance from. So that is certainly, you know, something out there. And I'm not the only person to say this. Moses brought this up, you know, back when Hiko was still on the team. Maybe put Hiko more of an entry role because his fragging ability is so good. Maybe use nothing as a lurker. I think they still could use that system. Maybe, maybe Shroud could be an entry fragger. I'm not sure how comfortable he is with that, but that could be something to look at as well with, with nothing more of a lurker. You know, make him useful. If, he, if you're going to stick with him, you're not going to make a roster change with him, then you need to find a place where he's sustainable. And maybe it's not as an entry fragger. Maybe it's as a lurker or something. And people have also talked about Shazam. You know, was he worth the pickup? 
as an op. I think it's too too quick to make a conclusion there. Um, he had a good game against Nip at Aspen. You know, yeah, he got crushed against Kabuma Mirage, but the whole team kind of did poorly there and kind of got shocked there. Uh, against Dignitas on D2, yeah, he wasn't able to, to be able to op on Dust2, which is a map that oppers can definitely really help you on and that you definitely can have an impact. Uh, so maybe that's a game you look at. But you can't really blame him there either because they lost 16-2. to 2. So even if Shazam did play better, it, I don't know if it's enough to overcome that big of a loss. So you can't scapegoat him. Uh, at the Katowice qualifiers against Mouse Sports, you know, he, he kind of did have some trouble once again on the Dust2 map, but they still won. And he didn't do horribly bad. He just didn't have a crazy good game. So it's too soon to call. For, for maybe Shazam and, and what type of role he plays on the team. But the bottom line is is that what they need to have to be successful is they need to find comfortable roles where everyone can kind of do something that they can be sustainable in. They need to work on some maps for sure. They, they've admitted their Mirage is kind of poor, but it's a map they seem to be playing a decent amount, so they need to be able to, to work on that. Um, their dust two and their cash seem to be maps that they can they can win on, so they need to kind of solidify those and, and get those going. It seems as though they finally moved away from Inferno, which might be for the best because they've struggled on it so much in the past, and so that may be a good move. But uh, you know maybe they look at some other maps like Overpass, like a Cobblestone, and some type of Shocker map that they can decide to surprise someone on. I'm not really sure, but they just need better preparations. They need better scouting, you know, demo reviews, and not just Sean, but they're like you know Shroud, for instance, which is something he's already admitted to. Uh, and they just need Shroud to to continue to play at the level he played at the Katowice qualifiers at the actual main event. And they can have nothing, maybe not playing as well at the Katowice qualifiers, but just, just somewhere uh, at a sustainable level, then then they they could they should be able to make it out of groups again at, at Katowice, depending on their draw. As far as how they do from quarterfinals forward, it really depends on who they get paired against. But I guess my conclusion is this: is yes, it is true that Cloud9 has been in a decline in, in the end of 2014. I don't think it's as bad as people made it out to be because, like I said, their losses come to teams that were ranked above them. It's not as if they were losing to teams they shouldn't lose to. Maybe they were losing by a margin they shouldn't be losing from, but it's not as if they, besides their Kaboom loss at Aspen on Mirage, they really haven't lost to a team that you would think they shouldn't lose to. So the slump isn't as bad as you think. They're still probably at the 8 or 9 level, but if they want to ever climb up from that and be a team that's ever going to challenge in the top four, then they need some of their players to get uh, in a position where they can be more sustainable role-wise. They need to perform at the level you expect, and they need to make the best out of who they can be. So if they have this high skill ceiling, they need to be taking the steps individually that they feel they need to and that their team can see to get to that level. Um, and if they're going to stick with this five, then they need to just work together more and better and, and get some good preparation, hopefully a boot camp before the main event at Katowice, and, uh, and go from there. So that is basically Cloud9 from the end of 2014. You know, their slump phase, their background, and then what they've done thus far in 2015 and what they can work on. And this video is already kind of long. I was thinking about doing all the teams at once, but I guess I'll leave it with just Cloud9. Uh, with that being said then, is I will release some more videos uh, throughout the end of this week and next week to talk about the other teams. I'll talk about, you know, I buy power at the end of 2014 and the dream team that never was, basically. I'll, I'll talk about that in the next video. Uh, and then after that, I'll talk about uh, CLG and Liquid probably in the same video and then I'll talk about some of the other teams that are left out there. I don't want to make this video horribly long and slam it all at once because this has drug on a bit longer than I expected. But I'll go ahead and put this out and then like I said, I'll work on a, a video for the I buy power story and then I'll work on a third video for Liquid and CLG and kind of the rest of the field. So thanks. If you enjoy follow up and look for more.